We've got quite a lot of people. Uh, we've got quite a lot of people joining us today in theory, but as always with online meetings, who knows how many will actually um, actually make it in. So we'll probably make, because it is kind of going to be quite a large room, we're going to leave everyone on mute if that's okay. And just encouraging people to make use of the chat function. Uh, and as things are going along to just kind of ask some questions in the chat and to have any kind of discussion in that in that chat space there'll be some time for discussion at the end as well just encouraging you to make use of that space before we do get started um, completely i'd just like to acknowledge that we're meeting today um, on the sort of on diverse lands in terms of where people are coming from and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the unceded lands which we're working meeting today um, and pay my respects to elders past present and emerging and acknowledge the deep spiritual relationship to country that has existed predating and enduring um, predating invasion and enduring now and I just invite you to pop in the chat um, your name, you know, if you're joining from an organisation and if you do want to share whose country you're joining from, um, please feel free to do that as well. So I think we'll kind of crack on into things. Um, and because I do know that we have quite a lot to get through, unsurprisingly, with a one-hour topic um, to discuss how to start and scale a food hub. So basically, in terms of who we are, um, at Open Food Network, we work to power fair and transparent food supply networks that reconnect communities and regenerate the earth. Um, we do that through, uh, we help to power a new food system. Um, so we help people to, with their e-commerce, um, we'll talk a little bit about that later, um, and with the sort of mechanism, things like logistics support for how to actually run a better food system. We provide a lot of hands-on support for short supply chains and we do that through shared resources, um, through shared learning days and through a lot of mentoring and coaching. We'll talk a little bit more about some of those bits of work that we've done as well. And then we also undertake food systems research and consulting. So we're a social enterprise consulting firm that um, undertakes work for clients that helps fund our not-for-profit work and a lot of that's around again how do we envision better food systems how do we design them how do we inspire people and bring funding towards them what are the conditions that they exist under that sort of thing we're working with food hubs and farmers around Australia um, these are some of the ones that we've worked with and what's I guess other also unique about us is that we're working with uh, farmers and food hubs around the world. So Open Food Network's now in um, around 20 countries. And these are just some of our colleagues from uh, looking at it. It's from Barcelona, from Canada, from the UK, Belgium. Uh, and there's all sorts of different ways that people are working together to build better food systems and to operate food hubs and yeah, to try and get a fair price to farmers uh, and ecological outcomes within our food system. In terms of what we're going to cover today, I'm just going to talk through a little bit of our work with hubs so that you understand with food hubs, so that you understand sort of where we're coming from and what some of the where some of these kind of lessons learned have come from and how we can help. Uh, we're going to give a bit of a high-level overview of what to consider at each stage stage of the food hub journey. And along the way, we're going to provide pointers to further resources, tools, products, and services that can help. Um, 
just for those who missed us, they were coming in at the start. If you've got questions that are coming up, please do share them in the chat as they're arising and we'll do some, some time at the end to talk through some of those questions and discuss some of those, um, some of those points raised. And one of the things that we want to emphasise is that as much as there's the sort of audacious how to start and scale a food hub title of today's webinar, um, in the end, we can't tell you what to do. And what we're aiming to do today is just share what we've learned it's useful to be thinking about at different stages. Um, it's really important to remember that every context is different. What you're trying to do in your community is, is different to what will work in another community. These are a magic solution. Um, if there were, We'd, we'd all be implementing it by now. Um, and I guess the way that we think about it is that we need a thousand different experiments, a thousand communities um, to be building a better food system. And so also just kind of making sure that people don't get disheartened um, if something isn't immediately working. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging thing to, to do to run a food hub. And so we're sharing just the things that you should be thinking about at each stage. Um, and I guess the other thing to remember is that these are all things that can help, but don't be put off by thinking it's like too big a task either. Um, and, you know, the important thing is just to sort of adapt as you scale and to pay attention to what you're doing. So I certainly don't want you to take away from this workshop today that you have to hit every single one of these before you even get a food hub off the ground. Um, that's not at all what we're, what we're trying to get across. So talking a little bit about some of our work with food hubs, um, we started with uh, running the, the Southeast Food Hub out in the outer suburbs of Melbourne um, from 2014 to 15. And we sort of coordinated the, um, the process of starting and launching and running that hub. Uh, and we've got a huge amount of lessons learned from that process. Um, and, I've, and we've got a link to that, which we'll share as well. Um, and that includes a lot of the analysis of what went wrong with different models and, you know, things like, are schools a good pick up and drop off place? You know, so um, as we're going through today's webinar, I will we'll have a lot of those little webinars, um, a lot of those little resources, and there's just a wealth of material um, in each of those. We ran the local food launch pad for a number of years, which was around helping um, it was City of Melbourne funded, so it was helping people in Melbourne develop their ideas for local food ventures, um, help them kind of run through the customer process and, the in and really incubate their sort of business into something that had an impact and was ready to sort of start up. Uh, we then undertook a range of mentoring projects across Victoria. Um, and so this was really working with community food enterprises. So those enterprises that are existing for public good outcomes, whether that's health, social, ecological. Um, and so we ran a mentoring project working with clusters of enterprises in three different regions, and then a sort of a statewide support service, again, to help people build their, um, their skills, build their understanding of their business model, their connection to community, all those sorts of things. Um, and so that was working with people like Food Next Door, Eddie Grocer, a whole bunch of other people. We've also in recent years worked on a lot of, um, a lot of processes with communities to help them design a food hub that works for them. Um, and so we take a co-design approach, which is all about bringing people together to hear from each other and to understand that what works for one segment of the community might not work for another segment of the community and sort of to try and design something that works for a whole community. So for example, done run with the city of Moreland um, where, and Fair Share Fair ran that with us. And we looked at how to establish a community food hub in the north of Moreland. And from that, we undertook some feasibility studies to understand the best ways to approach things and then have been working to support uh, a food hub a food leadership action group to, sh to set up that shared community food hub um, and kind of set up their governance and processes as well. And we're doing something quite similar in Hepburn at the moment. So uh, working with the local community of predominantly farmers and, and food retailers in that setting um, and looking at kind of what's a minimum viable product for a food hub and some actionable steps for a committee to kind of take forward in that region. 
During the pandemic, we worked with four food hubs across the state um, with support from the Working for Victoria program. And so we could provide resources, including some staff secondment into those hubs um, and also kind of collaborating between those different hubs and providing a whole heap of resources as well. And then along the way, we've been running shared learning days for community food enterprises and food hubs since 2016. And that's about bringing people together. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer learning as one of the sort of those really effective ways to help build knowledge. And even, you know, there's such little wins that can make a big difference for people. Um, and we've supported this with originally the Fair Food Forum um, as an online forum and now with our Australian Community Food Enterprise Facebook group, which again enables some of that sharing of practice. We also are in daily contact with food hubs and producers in Australia and all around the world. Those are just some of the many food hubs um, who you might recognise who we're working with. Um, a couple of the large ones you might know are Food Connect. We support all of their wholesale operations and have worked with them for a decade now. <laughs> Um, and then and enable that sort of entire model that, that they're working on. And then we also work with Series Fair Food. Um, so we custom build their bespoke software um, e-commerce that runs all of the Series Fair Food ordering. And so that's a little bit about our work with hubs. Our expertise is really around, you know, we've spent the last decade working with food systems. Um, we work on with food hubs on business planning, some of those co-design processes, operating frameworks, decision-making, governance support, like all of the skills that are needed um, to run a food hub. So this is just a bit of an overview. So that's the kind of background on what we've been working on with food hubs. Um, we've got some of our research around what the success factors are, within community food enterprises, including uh, food hubs. And as we're going through the kind of conversation today, it's just important to remember that there's these critical success factors around building your community, making sure that you're operating at the appropriate scale. And we'll talk about that at a number of points throughout today. Managing the impacts and making sure that you, you know, what you're doing is having the impact that you want and that you're tracking that and communicating it to the people who might care. Um, understanding the levers for viability, by which you mean sort of like how do you adjust what, you know, your costs are, what your prices are and so on to actually remain viable and how do you reduce some of those. Um, and then one of the massive things that we saw was uh, collaboration. So whether that's at a, as a food hub itself is, is essentially a form of collaboration um, and is bringing together a lot of different farmers often as a way to sort of scale rather than to scale individually, or whether that's collaborating in terms of sectoral knowledge and all of those sorts of things. So into the guts of it, what we have observed are some good things to think about as you are starting and scaling a food hub. And we're going to run through this in just the kind of the different stages. Um, and some of it is going to be pretty high level and it's really more about the questions to ask at that stage as much as anything else. So when you're in that, before you've even got a food hub and you're in that feasibility and co-design stage, it's really important to ask, is this really what you want to do? Because one thing that we have noticed is that it can be quite all consuming and it's good to actually think about what the role that this food hub might have in your life and where you want to take it, what size you want it to be, and sort of having that sense of a plan for it. Um, it's, not, it's not a bad place to start in terms of thinking about whether, whether this is what, what you've got space for in your life. A more practical sense, um, it's really important to understand who, who's going to use your food hub. So who's going to purchase the food? Who wants to sell food? And what are their needs? And that's where that idea of co-designing with your community comes in. So it's, there's no good, you know, it, it's no good designing something that's like um, the perfect outcome for the farmers in your region. And they have this beautiful vision of how this food hub will, you know, how they'll dock their produce and, you know, what their experience will be if there's been no understanding of 
anyone wanting to purchase food from the local area. So trying to do that kind of co-design process to pull all the kind of elements of a food hub together. Um, we've got a resource that we'll be publishing soon that is basically, it's an open source methodology of what we've applied in Moreland and Hepburn. And it's this kind of, you know, this gamified way of pulling your, your community's values and so on out. So all of that sort of stuff is around understanding your product to market fit, what do people want to buy, how much they're motivated to pay, all those sorts of things. There's a whole bunch of tools that we have available that can help um, with understanding some of these questions. And then you also want to think about where is this food hub going to be? What does it look like? You know, what are your options around some of that physical stuff? As you're getting your food hub ready to launch, um, there's no denying that food hubs are really challenging to make work commercially in Australia, um, probably elsewhere as well. And so as much as you can, trying to bring in funding from elsewhere that recognises the public good of these um, hubs. And so it's, it's quite realistic to expect to be kind of trying to draw in other funding. It's really worthwhile to try and build on partnerships so that you're not bearing all of the cost and risk yourself. As you're at this stage, you know, you really want to be starting to kind of understand your customers and be starting to market to them before you're ready to launch. Um, you want to sort of start have a customer base before, you, before you're buying your first food to sell. And this is where it's also really important to think about what's the smallest, leanest, lowest risk way that you can test some of those assumptions. And so the methodology that we love is um, the lean experiments methodology. And if you're unfamiliar with this, this is something that obviously there are books out there, there are resources on our website, but if you need to be guided through it, those are the sorts of things that we can help people with as well. And the key thing is to understand what's the riskiest assumption that you're making about why a food hub is going to work in terms of the problem you're trying to solve. And how do you test that at the leanest level in the lowest cost, lowest risk way and measure that? So sometimes that means not necessarily launching a food hub. It might mean, you know, doing something much, much smaller. So for example, even, you know, if you think of some of the really big um, food hubs in Victoria now, like Bauble Food Hub, that started as a box scheme off someone's back veranda, you know, and, and you sort of, that's what a minimum viable product was to test, well, will people buy food from local farmers? It's really important to think about e-commerce as a lean model, as something that can facilitate a lean model. So for example, the platform is the Open Food Network software platform is designed to facilitate that in terms of that you know, it, it recognises that order cycles occur. And so if you want to be buying, you know, if you want your farmers to be pulling those carrots out of the ground on Wednesday, then the orders need to come in by Monday and the customers need to pick them up on Friday. And so all of that sort of timing um, so that you've got guaranteed sales is, is made possible by the Open Food Network platform because it's designed for precisely this kind of scale and offering. You want to be thinking about your product offerings in terms of what people will buy. We really frequently see that um, often people will start with, say, vegetables. There's sort of lower compliance risk and so on around vegetables. But then once you add, for example, eggs and bread, you've suddenly got something that's more similar to a like a whole grocery shop and you'll suddenly sort of see this like spike in people actually buying on a weekly basis. And so kind of thinking around what the product offerings like that might be in your region based on some of that market research that you've done. One of the things that comes through over and over again is the importance of a team and a committed team. So even at this stage, it's really important to be making sure that you're not going it on your own and setting up a team who you share a vision with and who have skills, complementary skills to contribute um, and who you can work well with. Um, and it sounds maybe a bit crazy to some people to mention governance at this point, but we cannot emphasize enough that like governance, a failing to set up governance at any point in your food hub journey can sort of actually lead to it really failing at, at a sort of critical scaling point. So if you can start to introduce governance that scale appropriate, so what is like the leanest governance that's needed at this point in terms of like how are decisions going to be made? 
who gets to make you know the call on what gets bought or how money gets spent that sort of stuff trying to build that governance around decision making and empowering people to make decisions from as early a point as possible is going to set you really up, set you up well for the long term as you're then leading to launching a food hub this is where it's sort of the rubber hits the road a bit in terms of some of the elements that relate to the fact that you're selling food. Um, so it's a good idea to have some understanding of food compliance and some training around that if possible. There are free courses available online. There's a lot of, um, you know, councils take a great interest in this space. So look at what's available in your local region. Talk to your, you know, I think it's that thing of like, don't be scared to pick up the phone to your local government um, say environmental health person uh, and and talk to them about what you're hoping to do and what's possible. Um, obviously there's two schools of thought there. Some would go for the ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Um, so evaluate what you know about your local council. Um, but also, you know, if you if you can think about what some of that compliance stuff might be, it can kind of enable you to design the layout of your food hub for some of that. Um, compliance and safety stuff as you're going along. As we've talked about, like you've been hopefully building your kind of customer base before this, coming up with a launching plan, starting to talk through staffing and whether you're going to have volunteers, whether you're going to have people, you know, whether there's a co-op model that you're sort of looking to compensate people differently or require volunteering, starting to set up what your pricing margins will be and I won't go into that in too much detail today, but there's some really very, very detailed resources and webinars that we've run in the past on that that we'll be able to link to in the email going out afterwards uh, because that is something to kind of to think about in terms of the margins you need to make um, to make this work. And then just being really cautious about, you know, just careful about what your sales channels are. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Urban Food Network platform just because in the end, this is what, it is designed for. It is the only platform at the moment in Australia that is designed for food hubs. Um, and basically, you know, the setup time is really low. You can create a store in a couple of hours or less. Um, and you don't need to have your own website to get started. You also don't need to pay anything until you're selling more than $500 a month um, through the platform. And after that, it's a minimum of 1%, ideally 2 to 3% um, if you'd like to contribute to sort of improving the platform as well. Um, and then we also have free options for businesses that are owned by Indigenous Australians or not-for-profits where 50% of the leadership team is Indigenous. Um, there's so much in there that's the sort of features and functionality that have been built really, really focused on food hub needs, such as making it possible for producers to manage their own inventory um, without needing to invoice you and, you know, options that make order management easier. Um, and it's, look, it's tried and trusted. It's, you know, it's got more than $16 million of sales passing through the platform in a year. Um, and it's not for profit, it's open source. But the main thing is it is designed to help make running a food hub easier. There's a bit more information on the next slide with some of that stuff, um, which we'll just sort of leave in there for people who might be viewing these slides at a later date. Beyond that, I guess we're also talking about using technology as you're launching a food hub to make your life easier. Um, so thinking about, so we've also got a number of other options that are around how we either build bespoke software, you know, say for example, what we've done with Serious Fair Food, or when we're building on technology um, options that meet really specific needs. So whether it's about, you know, communicating with customers, so extra kind of add-on parts that are part that we can build on top of the platform. Um, there's also a number of, we've just received funding from Sustainable Table Investment Collaborative to fund some sort of new uh, enterprise dashboards that help hubs manage their kind of understanding of like, their what what what's kind of passing through the hub how they can make the most um the most from the customers that they have all of those sorts of things and basically there's so i think at this point all i can emphasize is there's so much stuff that we can build 
to make your life easier when you're running a hub. Um, so talk to us about what your needs are. Most of those are on either a fee for service um, or, you know, there are some that are on a kind of like access to an additional product. But there's a lot of options around how to use technology to kind of make the running of a hub much easier. So as you've launched your hub, maybe you've set up your sort of e-commerce, set up your sales channels, the things that we're sort of noticing at that point are um, how to work with suppliers. So looking at maps, when we're talking about scale matching here, it's about if you're a teeny tiny hub, um, then it's going to be really challenging for you to engage with the enormous farm that only deals in pallet loads. So if you, at this point, it's really important to kind of find collaborations with suppliers who match the scale uh, that you're working at. And that's, again, something where, you know, you can use the Open Food Network platform search function and map to sort of find suppliers um, or, you know, we can help you connect through to suppliers as well. Um, that's another paid service that we can offer as well. Uh, it is a good idea to try to establish some governance around some of these things. Um, there's, we've got some examples of contracts or memorandums of understanding with suppliers um, that people can build on. Um, a lot of things are done on like a goodwill handshake basis, which is also can be totally fine if that's what suits your context. But in terms of sort of managing some of that risk, there are options around how to try and put some a bit more formality around some things um, so that you know that you're going to be able to provide food or that something. Uh, it's there's some really interesting models. Um, I think we've got some resources around how people have set pricing and margins and so on with their suppliers. So negotiating kind of who gets what of which of the margin, how do you convey that to customers? Um, again, that's made a bit easier if you're using the Open Food Network platform because it displays within just within the general layout, um, you know, that sort of admin feeds will display um, pretty easily so customers can see that. But there's some, I think, form, some past webinars and resources that really talk about how to have those conversations and how different people have set their pricing agreements with producers. Um, obviously, a lot of what I'm talking about is direct relationships with producers. Some people will choose to go to um, like a wholesale market or so on. That's never been as much what we've focused on because we're really looking at ways that facilitate that transparent supply chain right through from um, your shopper through to a sort of an ecological outcome on a farm and a fair price for a farmer. And so the more steps you put between you and the farmer, the harder it is to maintain that transparency of, of sort of equitable transaction. There's also some really different inventory models that you might want to consider um, for if you're running an online food hub or a bricks and mortar food hub. Uh, that sort of image on the side there is just some of the high level components um, from some of our resources around, you know, whether you, how to set a cost markup versus a retail margin, whether you want to do a lower margin on your high volume sales um, components, you know, the things that you sell a lot of in order to kind of bring the people in versus, yeah, basically just like how you're kind of balancing that margin mix um, is there's a, a quite a bit of detail that you can choose to think through. Um, and that's a really great resource that we have on our site for those who are interested in it. As you're starting to kind of scale a food hub, um, we just want, probably at this point, you want to think about, it's almost like traps to avoid at this point as much as anything else. And so one thing that we see sometimes undo people is the cost of infrastructure and just how they kind of scale their staff. And so as much as possible, you want to sort of try to not pay for infrastructure for as long as possible. And the reason why I've shared a photo of Whittlesea Food Collective there is that they've got a really fantastic model of accessing, you know, so their food hub is based out of Melbourne Polytechnic's building. Um, and, you know, they really made the case to a number of partners, so Melbourne Polytechnic and Yarra Valley Water, about freeing up community assets and so gaining access to 
a cool room and a hub and a pretty significant irrigated acreage from Yarra Valley water to grow food. And it was around this kind of idea of like, these are community assets and how do we, um, you know, how do we make them available to our community for these public good outcomes? So how do we not pay for them in a rent term, but how do we instead free them up um, for that use? As people are kind of at this point in scaling a food hub, one of the other things that we kind of see is that they've done their first marketing push and they've reached these like early adopters or a close community. And then this is the point where you need to almost like, rather than just kind of like sitting, sitting pretty at this point, it's a really good idea to start thinking about, okay, well, how do we reach out into the next rung of, you know, the next round of our community? How can we use our existing community to sort of to reach out beyond just that close um, network? And so some of the ways that people have done that are things like incentivizing delivery zones. So say, for example, Edie Grocer in, um, down in Edithvale, you know, they've got a, a scheme where it's like trying, you know, basically like trying to convince your whole street to sign up for box deliveries from them and that that makes box deliveries for everyone in your street cheaper and so kind of using the power of your existing customers to expand your customers is a really effective um, tool for for food hubs um, in terms of kind of controlling cost exposure it's that one's a tricky one in terms of it can be people can just kind of barrel along um, not realizing what what their costs are and the fact that they're actually going backwards. So you can sort of be looking at your, your sales are going up, but then you realize that actually your costs have gone up as well. Um, and so probably the best piece of advice here is just around setting up your mechanisms so that you're actually aware of it. So looking at what you're spending, what you're, you know, looking at those kind of costs and, and, and income and having a plan for how you're going to review it um, how you're going to sort of evaluate and then implement any kind of adaptation. So how are you going to address it if it comes up or what are your trigger points for addressing things or what happens if it drops below this level? Do you do something different? Um, and, you know, is there a need for an exit strategy? But at this point, it's also like how do you kind of, again, bring your team along with you? So we talked a bit at the start about how to build a team that shares your vision and then probably what we haven't talked about as we're going through is the importance of bringing your team with you along the way and really kind of communicating, making sure that there isn't like a single point of failure of like one person who is holding all of that weight. Um, but this is a great example of where it's like using that hive mind, using the resources you've got available to you to kind of think through, well, what happens if this, if X, Y, Z happens, what are our triggers? What do we do? Uh, in terms of as people kind of scale, there is a really challenging jump where people shift often from a volunteer model to then having to pay salaries because people burn out um, over time. In some cases uh, where the volunteers have an additional kind of benefit from, from the food hub existing. So say, for example, if they're a producer and they're now selling 80% of their um, output at retail value then they've got to sort of you know it's it's really more like part of their actual business rather than necessarily just being kind of like a volunteering thing but it is a good idea to as you're starting to scale think about what are the salaries you're going to need where are you going to prioritize who are you going to prioritize first in terms of um, critical points of failure or roles that kind of unlock additional funding or roles that provide the greatest support so is it you know more important to have a volunteer coordinator that makes that experience really fulfilling and makes it possible for people to keep doing that rather than you know having one person take on responsibility um, for the whole process if that's you know where your food hubs at that's just an option uh, we also see that people will start to get as this sort of scaling a food hub you're going to start to see some drop-offs you know people will have kind of come through and then customers will, will kind of move on or, you know, something won't work in your model. 
And so there's, um, we've got some resources and webinars that have held in the past specifically on retaining customers. Um, and then it's also kind of thinking back to some of those early stages of a food hub and how do you make sure that you're meeting the needs? You know, how do you, is there a different product market fit? Is there a different product offering that you might need to be thinking about as part of what you're doing in order to either retain customers or if they're not the right customers, let them go and, and keep building more of the customers who are sticking around. And then as we raised right at the start in terms of success factors, it's really important to be thinking about how you're communicating your impact. So for most food hubs, realistically, it is going to be a little bit more challenging to shop with a food hub than it is the absolute convenience of, you know, the kind of industrial competitors that you're up against. And so for people to keep choosing you, yes, it has to be convenient and has to add other values to people's lives, like a sense of community or that sort of thing. But it's also quite worthwhile to think about how you're telling the story of why it's worth engaging with the food that you're selling. You know, is it providing, you know, is it subsidising um, food with dignity, like access, access to food with dignity for other people in your community? Is it paying a fairer price to farmers? Is it, you know, helping to fight climate change because of the agricultural practices it supports? You know, so understanding what that impact is and communicating it to people is going to help you with that sort of retain some of those customers as well or like remind them why they're bothering to engage with you rather than another option. Talking about the very sexy topic of packing and logistics um, it's really important to think about safe manual handling and the kind of being aware of occupational health and safety um, it is you know in the end you want your food hub to be safe you want it to be low risk and and doing everything you can and it's, you know it's really worth investing in tools such as like you, know, you can see the roller there where it's like boxes move along the roller at a waist height you know looking at what manual handling things there are to help make your food hub as safe and um, risk-free as possible uh, there are some as you're kind of like thinking about the sort of packing and logistics processes um, you know look there's a whole there's a whole host of different resources around how to actually how people do food packing, you know, whether you do all the tomatoes first or all the, or you do one box at a time, you know, coming from different, uh, you know, different sources, but there's a whole bunch of different ways that people do it. And it depends on your space and so on as to which works for you. There are some methodologies that you can kind of engage with. So spaghetti maps are where you're kind of mapping, like you look at like where people move through your food hub and then how do you reduce that down from a spaghetti map to just a few short lines? So how do you, you know, reduce the distances people are having to travel and how do you make it so that people aren't tripping over each other? All of those sorts of things. So kind of paying some attention to that. It can feel really, um, I don't know, mundane or something, but it can actually just make things feel easier, less stressful on packing days, all of those sorts of things. Um, and so there is like, you know, within the lean methodology documents as well, there'll be, um, there'll be some guidance on that as well. It's worth considering what scale appropriate infrastructure is for you. So do you need cool rooms? Do you need mobile cool rooms? Do you need dry storage? But thinking about that kind of scale, are you engaging with food hubs who, uh, sorry, are you engaging with, um, like farmers who can only deliver with a pallet. Um, my apologies if you can hear background noise. Someone start council started leaf blowing outside my window. Um, but are you, you know, looking for space that, like, are you receiving flour in a bulk form that will have require you to have forklifts, for example? How are you going to design for safe passage around your food hub so that people aren't walking in that same area at that time? As you're thinking about receiving and distributing your food, um, some of the options that you want to consider are just around what the kind of, how long you have to hold 
food for and are there ways that you can minimise the infrastructure that you potentially need to hold by having kind of some shorter turnaround times. For example, um, again, maybe like an Eddie Grocer example, in their really early days, they were looking at a model, and this is possible because of what's available in their region, um, but they were looking at a model where they would do pick up from farmers in the morning, they would do box packing in the afternoon and delivery that afternoon. And so they just did a one day a week food hub, but it meant that because it was immediate and it didn't have you know, meat or dairy involved, they didn't have to have a cool room at that point. Uh, and they were able to instead, um, I think they moved on to having cool rooms at a later date and they would then do um, a just a two-day cycle where everything that didn't go into boxes on the Wednesday would get sold at a retail option on the Thursday afternoon, for example. So just thinking about how you're kind of managing that flow in and flow out of food um, as well. And then just thinking about how a customer is going to access the food. Is there going to be a retail market pick and choose space? Is it box pickup? Is it delivery? What works, again, in terms of your um, setup, I guess, and, and what's yeah what, what's needed just briefly uh in terms of talking about ways of working again just like governance and not to ignore it um it has an option for you know it just is sort of one of those things to keep building at, at the same scale that you're building at um you know it's just thinking of it not as kind of a dry thing but thinking of it as like it's a tool it's a key tool for efficient decision making and importantly for succession as well and that's one of the points where we really see some food hubs fall down is that because they haven't put in the effort on who can make decisions and that sort of thing when it becomes the next generation of food hub leaders trying to take it on it's really unclear like can anyone who can make a decision what are the decisions to be made do they have to ask everyone you know so thinking about building that sort of stuff as you grow so that you're ready at any point for succession um, in terms of some of the other ways of working, we've mentioned some of the e-commerce options around digital tools, but don't forget that there are other kind of tools available to you. So, you know, way up when to build something from scratch or when to buy it off the shelf. Um, so there are things for, you know, there are tools for communicating. There are things like MailChimp for emails or customer relationship management databases. Um, there are volunteer management tools um things for tracking time or money so just kind of but I think it's a little bit part of that kind of like cost exposure measurement of knowing when are you sinking too much time into a workaround uh and actually something off the shelf might might save you time so having kind of some mechanisms for like mm, okay we're spending six paid hours on this a week could we actually spend would it cost us less to have a tool that did that and you know free up that person to do something with community building or something bigger um, that helps growth or retention, that sort of stuff. Again, just kind of emphasising the lean experiments and riskiest assumption testing kind of methodology. Um, it's a really useful way to kind of, as you're going along, to just always take that experimental mindset. Like we said at the very start, there's not some magic model out there for how to run a food hub that is covering its costs you know all of that sort of stuff so being comfortable with the idea that like oh okay like we think that we're losing customers for this reason what's a way that we can run a really lean experiment to test whether we can fix that um, and kind of embedding that type of practice into your ways of working can be really helpful and I guess not letting go of community development as you go you know it's just really so important for a lot of models um, that we're talking about, you know, developing your community as you're growing. Final thing is maturing a food hub. So I've mentioned briefly there around succession planning, but actually actively planning for succession and then actively transitioning, like making the call and helping people understand that they've got a, a space to make decisions or to take ownership of something. Um, Again, it's, you know, as you're kind of maturing a food hub, you're going to be reaching a different stage of marketing and different forms of partnerships in your community with other businesses, that sort of stuff. And so it's kind of 
there's almost like a kind of like you know we, we sort of talk about like building gravity almost and like building a a sense of stability around it and how you build those relationships across your community is really important um, to really like solidify that space and, and open up any of those opportunities like infrastructure or um, additional funding or additional markets, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and again, just we see people going through these cycles of, of losing customers periodically as well, of just sort of like, it's, it's unfortunate that it just doesn't self-sustain, that it's like once you've got them, they stay forever. But just, again, revisiting what you can do around customer retention, around reaching out, helping your community help you reach out, all of that sort of stuff. We have a, a lot of the things that I've talked about today, we've got free resources on our website about them. Um, I really encourage you to check them out. We'll be sending an email with some that we've pulled together that we think is specifically relevant um, to this question of starting and scaling a food hub. Um, but we'll do our, you know, there's, there's so many on there. Um, so please do access those. Obviously, at the moment, we're aware that there's Vic Health funding um, of around $4 million for food hubs in Victoria. And just wanted to emphasise that a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today, we can help guide you through. So, you know, we've, as a team, we've got decades of experience in this space um, and we can provide, you know, con consulting services around a lot of these topics. So anything from that kind of co-design, feasibility studies, business planning, how to run those lean experiments, what your e-commerce offering is, what your other sales channels are, do you need help setting up technology? Do you want to be part of a community of practice? Do you need mentoring? Basically, we've run projects in so many different ways um, across this space. And so just talk to us if you want a quote to include in a grant application or if outside of Victoria, if you want to access our services in this space as well. Um, you know, we're, we're always really delighted to talk to people about what's possible in their region. Um, we can't do it for free, but we, we always want to help as much as possible. Um, so if you do want to access those, uh, the best first port of call is always emailing hello at openfeednetwork.org.au if you're interested. Um, and yeah, we can take it from there. Uh, so that's probably kind of gives us about 12 minutes for um, the questions if, um, or discussions. Um, so I, I think my colleague Alex has sent through some of the ones um, and I'd certainly invite, I know I've got quite a few co um, colleagues from Open Food Network in here as well. So if they want to help jump in and answer some of these as well. Um, but one of the questions that's come through was, I'm wondering what the general food miles are in the access of local produce for food hubs. Um, and I'm also wondering about packaging and whether there are food hubs that have successfully engaged producers in reducing packaging, namely plastics, in their food hubs that's usually involved in food purchasing in traditional supply chains and farmers markets. So, I don't know if anyone else as well wants to jump in there. Um, in terms of the general food miles kind of question for local produce, um, that is something that is incredibly unique to each food hub. So most, um, it's, I guess, at that really early stage in terms of if that's the core thing that is the value proposition of your food hub or the vision of your food hub, and you're building a team and a community and a customer base, that's probably where I would set that definition. Um, there's no right or wrong one. So, for example, you know, we've seen food hubs, maybe it's more in the UK than here, but, like, you know, food hubs have split in the past over whether or not to stock bananas because they come from too far away. So you, you sort of need to make that call um, on the trade-offs of it. So are you going to have bananas and... In doing so, you probably means that you'll either have to build 
a direct farm relationship with a farmer in Queensland or a wholesale market relationship. Um, but And so that might not be with your values, but it might be because you want to pr provide an option that's non-corporate and a, you know, a complete shop and you know that 80% of your customers require bananas in their weekly shop. So I think that basically there's not a there's not like a, a an industry definition it really comes down to setting that vision and the value proposition that matches what your impact is and your um, customer base wants would be my suggestion I don't know if others um, can I just add a little something else to that Jen as well um, which I think it's it's worth for any food hub when thinking about kilometres or distance is to do some initial scoping and research of what's available within what distance um, because you do want to have a viable range of products to offer a customer. Um, a, a local example that I'm part of is um, Gordon Food Hub and we have only a 60 kilometre radius and that was decided on a, on a values hyperlocal principle but it actually means that we can't access a lot of um, types of produce or different kind of scales of agriculture that might make certain produce more affordable. So I think it's definitely worth having a look around at what's available within certain, um, you know, our scopes of distance. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and then there was the other question, component of that question was around um, packaging. Um, yes. Certainly there are uh, components like different, different food hubs who are managing to source different parts of their um, produce without plastic packaging. Um, a lot of producers, a lot of food hubs in Victoria, for example, would sort of source, say, for example, like a lot of their bulk grains and that sort of thing from Barambat Dynamics or Turong Farm, and in doing so avoid plastics um, and and manage to do sort of bulks. Um, I don't know if others have examples to chip in with. I think it's like probably, you know, there'd be, there's lots of examples, but I don't have like a cohesive answer to that one. I suggested further down, Jen, it's Serenity here, um, just to Tas Produce Co, a, a food hub in Tasmania that spring to mind that are doing some really good stuff around um, uh, best practice around package sustainable packaging with their producers. So that might be one to contact. And I think we've got, um, uh, I know that we're interviewing them later in the week for a resource. So maybe that's another question that we can add in, in, um, in our interview with them and publish something as well on our website. Uh, I think the next one that we had was around tips for getting more consumer slash producer involvement. So a small few aren't doing the lion's share of the work. Uh, I'll throw over to other colleagues um, if they've got ideas on that one as well. The advice that I would offer would be to um, define roles as clearly as possible and um, potentially um, making them as manageable as possible. So discrete particular roles, um, I think often have a greater chance of um, engaging and sustaining volunteers. Um, that's not, yeah, I guess that's not specifically talking to consumers or producers, but just volunteers generally. Um, I think sometimes um, when, when food hubs are reliant on a very few people, they end up doing a lot of little jobs um, and, and really trying to um, pull those roles out and package them up, um, I think can, can be really helpful. Thanks, Georgia. Does so anyone else um, from the team have tips? Yeah, thanks, Randy. Yeah, um, maybe, um, I think Strathbogie Local at the moment are looking at like, you know, looking at where they can fund a small, role that does the, the coordination stuff but then thinking about how to have more broad-based involvement in say their packing day so having producers you know rostered on to come and help with the packing day where it's easier to kind of get more people um, involved so yeah it's it's probably just echoing what Georgia said in terms of those like core smaller number of people for those core roles but then how to think about 
ways to engage a broader number of people um, in, in something like packing, for instance. I think there's also, you know, we've seen, you know, there's different, I guess, um, you know, there's different business models. So you might want a food hub that is run as a co-op and, you know, that has a requirement for people to be more involved. Um, that has its own downsides as well in terms of it can be challenging around democratic decision making if if you don't have an engaged community but uh certainly you know that's I guess a tried and true model for like having volunteer shifts and having you know your your consumer body um being part of having a sense of being a member of something rather than a user of something um so building that kind of ownership of processes and and so on as well and then having a really clear entry point where it's just like okay in order to help I sign up for a shift it looks like this it is easy it's not sort of an amorphous oh I should help more you know so that can be you know just echoing that kind of roles thing uh, there's been a question around would love to see some examples of food hubs that are actually profitable case studies um, I think realistically, most food hubs in Australia are um, cost covering <laughs> rather than uh, profit making. Um, but I don't know what else, what else, you know, I guess in some ways, a lot of the case studies that we have on our website are sharing as much as they've felt comfortable sharing about what is making their model work and remain sustainable um yeah and then there are those kind of like five components of some of those common elements that have made community food enterprises again like re remain viable but serenity do you have some other thoughts there um just to kind of maybe emphasize how difficult it is for the, <laughs> the sector i think this question of viability um really sustainable viability is still an open um, question across the board. And I think where, like it's, you asked the question about profitability, like often what happens when you sort of see on the surface a really successful um, food hub, they might be hitting on like one of their objectives, um, but then, then, you know, some of the other things fall by. So, so a common example is, um, uh, volunteer fatigue over time or you know so where, where there's success in one area it might be um, having a cost that's unseen in another area so I think what we kind of advocate is being really honest and and tracking what are those multiple outcomes that a food hub is trying to achieve and and really um, making conscious decisions about um, cost and benefits for each of those things and and yeah, managing risks around that but yeah, there's no magic bullet and there's no, um, you know, perfect success story. <laughs> yeah, and I guess that is, you know, why we've tried to keep sharing as many of those kind of peer learning opportunities as well because often it's those micro adjustments or like those little things that people are doing that can make a difference as well. Um, and, again, yeah, I think just, you know, I know I've said it a, a number of times but accepting that this is an experimental space, you know, that there's a lot of money and energy being directed at making the industrial food system work. And, you know, we're kind of all trying to target this from, you know, in these like a thousand experiments in a thousand communities type of models. Um, so just, I think, taking, taking that approach and being comfortable with um, building that knowledge base and then thinking about how as a food hub you do share those things back out as well um yeah so I think that kind of paying it forward in that way as well and participating in some of those open sharing opportunities as well mm. um I think there's probably only other the only other questions are maybe a bit more around the sort of open road logistics side of things which um we'll try and make contact offline rather than sort of talk through here because I think it's it's like a whole nother webinar to talk about the sort of open road and logistics and, and so on. Um, so yeah, if you want to uh, contact Serenity directly on that one, that might be a better way to kind of progress that conversation. 
Um, but otherwise, I just would really like to thank you all for, for coming um, and wish you really well in wherever you're at in the stage of your food hub journey that has brought you to this webinar today um, and encourage you to join our Facebook group so that you can kind of keep connecting with other people who are running community food enterprises and absolutely to kind of hop on our website and access resources and so on. Um, you'll get a follow-up email with links to these sorts of things. And then, yeah, just letting us know um, if there's any way that, you know, we can apply our knowledge to, to help your food hub. Um, you know, we're always really keen to shape up projects. And if you're applying for the Vic Health funding, we'd love to be included in your application with some of these skills and projects, services, um, and really keen to help you make that um, make that possible and to sort of get as much of what we have learned into those projects as possible. So thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Mm -hmm.